Listen to the sound of footsteps in the dark. To voices that may not be quite human. To the sound of screams in the night. The haunted cabaret. The home of all things horror. On Rhode Island Free Radio.org. With your host, George Garner. The haunted cabaret starts now. That was All Guts, No Glory, Exhumed, here on the Haunted Cabaret. I'm your host, George Garner. Across from me, Chuckles the Clown, Nurse Misery in attendance, our producer, Tony Jones. You know, it's funny. The, some of the newest guidance in the radio industry is calling for ensemble casts to host radio shows, something we've been doing here for many years. One of the best ensemble casts right here on the Haunted Cabaret. Once again, setting the trends. Absolutely, and you know, in a way, you know, there's been ensemble casts for years too because they just didn't give them credit. Yeah, right. It was one idiot, and you know, taking all the credit. But I mean, you don't produce a radio show without a quality producer, without well, basically without people watching your ass. Wait a minute, that means you're Howard, and the rest of us are the whack pack. Uh, the do I want to assume the mantle of? A modern-day Howard Stern. <laughs> That's a loaded question. Mr. I'll tell you, from a, from a moral point of view, I have no problem with it. <laughs> um, I don't know. I just is Howard Stern still fresh and invigorating well, and exciting, is he still or, or is relevant? he? Yeah, you know, just, Howard Stern is in his late fifties, and he just married a girl in her thirties. I mean, I don't know who would do that. <laughs> yeah, who, yeah, who would do that? Who, who, who would even think of it? I have no. I haven't done it yet. Uh, <laughs> I have like five good months in me yet. But, um, I'll tell you, I sat down here to do the show, and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to lead off with. But then the unseen power <laughs> that looks out for the Haunted Cabaret, indeed all our shows here on Rhode Island Free Radio, walked in. The muse. <laughs> the me- Thank you, Tony. The dark, moronic muse. I just sat here patiently awaiting you. Not that the power looking out for the Haunted Cabaret is moronic. I'm saying the power that looks out over our station sent in a moronic muse. (laughs) And the moronic muse is in the form of this dopey-looking woman that hands me a card saying, no HPV mandate Rhode Island. Now, I don't know. I thought that had something to do with hepatitis or HIV or something. I'm all for that. You know, if we can have less of that here in New England. Yeah, that would be great yeah, to have less, less, AIDS. A- less AIDS. less Stay AIDS. out of Mardi Gras. Yeah. That, that's fine. Um, but apparently what it is is Rhode Islanders, and by the way, um, as of next week, I will no longer be living in Rhode Island, so I won't be a Rhode Islander anymore. But for the time being, I'm included in this nonsense. Um, Rhode Islanders against mandated HPV vaccinations. Now, if somebody gives me the eight definition of HPV, human... 
Human papillomavirus. Okay, now that is the that is the virus that's supposed to do what? Uh, that I have to double check on. Is that the but one that I gives girls? Is it. that the one that gives girls um, cancer or something? I believe it has something to do with cervical cancer okay, risk good. being higher. I I was hoping it did, because now we have the reprehensible spectacle of this female who walks in here who has probably long ago been vaccinated herself against everything under the sun by her own thoughtful mother, who walks in here and is protesting the idea of vaccinating her female children against uh, cancer of the crotch. <laughs> now, I don't know what kind of... I'm glad she's not my mother. I mean, you know, my mother, when I was a kid, you know, when I was a young child, she, she vaccinated me, and she gave me a copy of H.P. Uh, Lovecraft to read on my sixth birthday. That was, and you know, then she uh, brought me to a Black Sabbath concert. That was my mother. Okay, my mother didn't try to kill me <laughs> <laughs> by by inducing some kind of cancerous growth in my uh, nether regions. Yes, because it can also affect men in a much slimmer factor. You mean? Uh, you, They're you mean, trying it, it can to happen. vaccinate young boys as well. Okay, because the, uh, the point being that my mother, you know, didn't try to kill me. By yeah. giving me cancer. She wanted to give you the healthiest life you could right. have. Now I assume that now is this some kind of now is this some kind of plot of the born again Christians? I know the HPV vaccine came out more recently. It's one of the newer things. It yeah, came out but, when I was in my late teens. But now now that I'm looking at this card, but. which will be burned on an altar as soon as I finish this show. <laughs> Now that I'm looking, it seems to me that I remember hearing a, a radio program on one of our rival network radio shows about this, and it was something about the the Christians were upset about it because they said immunizing women or young girls against this HPV thing um, starts giving them ideas about their sexual regions and could promote uh, underage oh, sex. Sweet, I've heard that because is that I mean. Does that sound familiar to you, Nurse Misery? Yes. Because there's some people that are like, oh, well, now that they know they're safer because sexual activity can, I guess, yeah, they're safer, be a part of it. Yeah, they're safer it. from getting cancer as a result of sexual activity. Yeah. Not safer from getting AIDS, hepatitis, gonorrhea, syphilis, herpes. Any of the list of STDs. Right. Right, all those STDs are still potent and alive. Yeah. But apparently, yes, because it makes young women immune to uh, getting cancer of the cervix, yeah, these, pe these people are lobbying against it. I don't know. And they, I'll tell you, and they say that the um, haunted cabaret rituals are cold-blooded and inhuman. I don't know. Just I'll tell you, unique. you know, these, yeah, these, 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 these born again Christians, I'll tell you, these fundamental Christians. And it's been out long enough where they know it's not something that affects children. Or no, be, no, like see, that and that's, see, and that's the big, see that, and that's like, even now, now granted, we indulge in all kinds of evil behavior and bad habits. Oh. We encourage them all here in the cabaret of and on Chuckle Script. But even on the haunted cabaret, hypocrisy. Kind of Just still has a bad, is the only thing that still has a little bit of a, unless it's in my benefit. <laughs> unless it benefits me, I, you know, uh, hypocrisy. Which is a rare case. Not that rare. I mean, yeah, hypocrisy still carries, carries a bad name, yeah. you know, on this show somewhat. So what they're doing is... Now, it's not just this HPV thing. Aren't they some people against all the vaccinations? There are some people that are totally like, you cannot vaccinate your children. Oh, my God, it causes autism when... No, it doesn't, people. Yeah, it causes autism. <laughs> now, these, now, these are people... Now, first of all, autism exists. It is prevalent, more prevalent than we would like it to be. It's a problem. It is not caused by vaccines. No, and they've proven no. that time and time again. No, probably one thing that probably causes it is some of these alternate bad habits. Yeah. <laughs> you know, caused by, oh, and by the way, Nurse Misery, congratulations on your abstinence from alcohol during <laughs> your uh, pregnancy to term. To avoid the whole to fetal avoid. alcohol syndrome. Yes, yes. That's a real thing. <laughs> yes, that's a real thing. And yeah. Not to lose my train of thought, where, where was I going with this? The, the idea that vaccinations... Vaccinations cause autism, cause, according thank you, to yes, a that they cause large autism. group. 
they don't, vaccinations only cause autism if your educational level is maybe like so second what? grade and you oh. fell on off your desk onto your head. Or Coventry High School. <laughs> Coventry High School, yeah, I, I can give Coventry High School some competition, you know, here and there. But, yes, you only believe vaccinations cause autism if you only completed a second grade level of education, yeah. fell out of your desk onto your head during science class. And now you have the IQ of and, a toddler? Yeah, now you, well, no, now you have the IQ of kind of a, a slime mold clinging to a pier out at Narragansett yeah. Bay. <laughs> That's basically who believes that vaccinations cause autism. No, it's just, it's another case of kind of like, now, now here's my pet peeve. Now, like I said, it's very shortly I want to be moving up to Connecticut. You know, not the wilds of Connecticut, but, no, but you know, close enough. You know, like, like a three-minute ride puts me deep in the woods, you know, where I can do all kinds of things undisturbed. You mean right over the border where you can enjoy all the benefits of Rhode Island, which is a great state, without any of the hassles? Yeah, I'm, yeah where I can be unconnected to warmer and cooler or cooler and warmer and... <laughs> I don't have to pay any uh, excise tax on my car anymore. I can actually, like, buy. Uh, hell, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to buy two cars just for myself. <laughs> <laughs> and and they're gonna, I'm going to park them in my yard. I'm not even going to drive them too much. I'm just going to park them in the yard and just kind of polish them. <laughs> you know, and just, like, just, you know, just give the finger in the Keep direction. Keep the Rhode Island plates on it. <laughs> yeah, you know, ki- you know kind of like the Muslims you know, bow down to Mecca you know, every day for prayers. <laughs> you know, once a day, I'm just going to turn toward Rhode Island and just give it my finger. <laughs> You know, as I, as I have my lot yard, yard full of automobiles. There you go. I, th- I you, think that's going to be. You just have your car lot tax-free. Yeah. Okay. Bef- yeah, before we rant any further, let's go back to the music for a second. Let's go to, uh, this is a little unusual for the cabaret. Let's do some Madonna of the Wasps, Robin Hitchcock, here on the Haunted Cabaret on Rhode Island Free Radio. <laughs> All right, we are back. That was Madonna of the Wasps, Robin Hitchcock. And Chuckles, uh, as at the tail end of that song, you just 
made an announcement across this table that uh, shook me to the core with an excitement. What is it? The uh, fabled and legendary Amityville Horror House is up for sale once again. And I'll repeat in a disgusted tone of voice what I just repeated to you off air. I just bought a house. Well, I'm, you should have waited. It, it, you could have gotten it. It looks like it's uh, listed at close to a million dollars. It's eight hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Uh, so okay. <laughs> Plus, uh, maybe out of price range. I'm about eight hundred thousand dollars short. <laughs> <laughs> and it comes with all the ghosts and demons you want. So. Well, okay, the now portal I'm, to hell is awesome. But. Yeah, now I'm not sure. I think that might belie the entire Amityville legend right there. <laughs> you know, I mean, the whole idea of you know the house being priced dirt cheap yeah. because nobody would buy it because it was possessed and haunted and all the rest. I think that can put the last nail in the coffin to yeah, the Amityville that, horror story right there. Yeah, no. you have the notoriety without the haunts. Yeah, I'm looking at a picture of it now, and it. Doesn't, that even it, it doesn't look the same I'm looking, at no. all. It doesn't even look like the same house. No, They've done some add-ons They to switched the around the windows specifically yeah. so people would stop driving by. It looks like a, a two-floor ranch house with uh, porches ugly. coming off yeah, it. Yeah, because you know, that legendary fan light window, was that just something they did for the big Roger Corman movie? Or no, was those, those lights those were in the building. The and they were original. And they boarded them up, and th- this does not... This looks like a nice house in Newport. There's no... Uh, I'm wondering if that is that even the right picture for the listing. I, yeah. yeah. Yep. It's the huh. picture attached to the article, right. at least. I know, but what I'm saying is, is that you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They put like the maybe exact we can house find the, the retail it or says, the realtor listing. Yeah, well, let's see if I can find the source of it, but I'm pretty sure that's that's the picture of the house. Okay, but yep, any, it is. And uh, okay, I yeah. see it from the I see the side profile now. Yep, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Wow. Okay, now here's now here's the thing. Speculation, right? I wonder. Now. I host the Haunted Cabaret. I enjoy all things horror. When it, as I've said to Chuckles, I'm not shy about this. You know, we have a difference of opinion. When it comes to the supernatural, I am an avowed skeptic. Not a closed-minded skeptic, but an avowed skeptic. I wonder what my reaction would be. You know what I'm saying? Were I literally... Living in the beast. To, li- to move in there and live in it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, would my skepticism hold up? Or I, you know, I just want, that would be an interesting experiment. Or in spite of all my rationality, would, once I was in there and the lights were out. Would your mind just wander? Exactly. I mean, you know, it would be a battle between uh, the intellect and the uh, subconscious. Jeez, I might do this just for the hell of it. You can schedule a visit Sweet. to the house oh right now. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I might do it's that a, just. It's a conventional open house. Uh, it says schedule a visit right underneath request info. I might just do that just to seem like I'm interested, walk through there with my recorder and then uh, you walk know, out. You know, you know what, though? I think they're probably on guard for exactly that. I think if any of us in this room were to show up for a showing of that house, I think that they probably wouldn't let us buy the front gate. They would ask, are you pre-approved for $850,000 yeah, and can yeah, you let prove us, it? Yeah, let us okay. see your last paycheck. <laughs> from the Trump yes, organization, they ask for a pre-approval letter and or your doomed. pre-approval letter from your, you know, your but grandfather's if, inheritance. <laughs> but if we just play the, oh well, we're expecting and we need a larger home and we're looking to relocate, maybe we can coax our way in. I from from the look of expectation on all our faces, they would no. We we could try as hard as we could. Yeah, it, no. it but still has uh, keep it's, a straight none face. of us, not one of us. It still has the fabled boat slip there too. The boat I house. I mean, we could always play there. like the full house that aspect and be like, well, we need the extra uncles to live there to afford the house. <laughs> and blah 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 blah. And yeah, now that's that's a good question too. Now, were there to be a genuinely, you know, and I, I'll put genuinely in quotation marks or or not, you know depending on how you want to look at it. If there were to be a genuinely haunted house, or a house people genuinely believe to be haunted, these days would that improve the price or would we still get the dirt cheap? I think it would improve it too I much. Think, yeah, yeah. Right Pop now. culture likes that stuff. It's not one of those things that scares people away anymore. No, no. now it draws them in. It's a novelty factor. It's exactly. kind of like having a jacuzzi tub. But I'm looking at this thing, ghost. and this, like I said, it looks like a nice house up that would be on the beaches of Newport. Yeah. Now, uh, if I ever want to sell my house, the first thing that's going to happen is it's going to become haunted. I think. <laughs> and, I mean, that, it, like yeah. you said, it can't help. It can't hurt the marketing. No, not in now, this state. Now, is the, is there anything nowadays that would? I mean, like, because hauntings, people are being murdered in your house, definitely. Yeah, yeah now, people. See now that. See now that's funny. I, w- I was. That was. I was going to ask. Right. 
Yeah, that's funny. Now, haunting is okay. Right, is okay. That's not. That's cool. But right? gruesome murder. But a gruesome murder. Now, does anybody but me sense a disconnect here? Yeah, yeah it, it's a little. It's one in the same. You're right. No, no, right. I mean, you know that, and I know that. But I'm just wondering, what does that say about people's? What would you say? Beliefs about the supernatural. Yeah. Okay. Or their thoughts on pretty much anything. Or people do have people have thoughts. I think it comes down to the fact where the murder is definite. It's there. They got paperwork on it and everything. Whereas the ghost stories are all word of mouth and ears and cameras or whatnot. So it's so much you're getting attracted to the thought and the theory of the ghost being there versus the reality. Reality. There was twelve people butchered in the living room that you just stepped into, right. and the blood stain is still soaked into the carpet, and it won't come out. Right, which tells me that people, you know, that even ostensibly believe in the supernatural or believe in ghosts, believe in demons mm-hmm. and so on, that belief might be thin. Yeah. In other words, they believe it on some level. They want it to happen, but they, they want don't. It, they want it to be true, but... They don't want to live in it. Right. Right, they want it to be true for the same reason that people want, let's say, you know, I, I won't... I won't pick on the Christians, but I'll mention angels, right? Yeah. People want ghosts to be real, the same reason they want angels to be real, the same reason they want extraterrestrial visitors to be real. Mm-hmm. You know, they, it just adds more, like they're bored. It's something to believe in. They're bored, and it's, it's something, it'll add more to life. Yeah. You know, there's just a little something more than their miserable job. You know, that's why I never really had a full-time miserable job. So this way I don't have to believe in extraterrestrial aliens to have a good time. <laughs> but... I think that's what's behind it. You know, that's what, you know, I, th- I think people, their belief is really thin in anything, you know, paranormal or supernatural. Now, to your point, and speaking of Connecticut, this Friday, uh, this uh, Saturday, June 11th, in Connecticut, folks are actually being invited out to see Annabelle the Doll. Y- yes, they are. Annabelle the Doll of Ed and Lorraine Warren fame, apparently and supposedly locked up in their occult museum because it is too dangerous to have any contact with other human beings except apparently when you need to pay your mortgage or your <laughs> rent because yeah as tony said you know june 11th it is on show you can have your picture taken with annabelle the evil doll now even though annabelle's the most famous one there was a series of supposedly demon possessed toys throughout this uh throughout this period but annabelle kind of just is the uh, most well-known one yeah, I mean, there is, and, you know, movie aside, because the movie didn't really present the Warren story. I mean, I'll tell you, there is, I read the Ed and Lorraine Warren book, Demonologist, and I will say that, you know, you read that book, you know, with, you know, after dark, you know, with, <laughs> in a chair by lamplight, I'll tell you, there is something uniquely scary, even to somebody that's read as many horror stories as I have, there is something uniquely scary about the image of a Raggedy Ann doll kneeling in a position of prayer, with three drops of blood on its face. Yeah. I mean, that, like, I get a shiver right just now. Haunting. Just That is creepy. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I guess when they made the Annabelle movie, though, they didn't have, they didn't want Raggedy Ann to be, the, you know, they didn't want to use the Raggedy Ann because of copyright or something, or? I don't know if it was a copyright issue or if they just thought the doll they created the was scarier. The porcelain doll was scarier, which would be another st- a really stupid decision and a long line of decisions yeah. by... You know, movie studios you're because not honoring the story. Not yeah. honoring the story, and I, I just watched. Oh, I just watched Aunt, the movie Annabelle a couple of nights ago. As a matter of fact, so the timing is good. It was by the numbers. I thought. Yeah. If you guys saw, in other words, okay, okay. this, then this, then this, then this, yep. the end. Okay, and yeah, I mean, and yes, they made the doll the face sinister and everything. Yeah. But <laughs> no, that that's the easy, that's the easy way to do it. And yeah, it, they really, copped out. Yeah, the movie didn't really get the job done. At least they didn't completely sell out and contact Hasbro and get a line of uh, you know demon dolls made. Yeah, it wouldn't work. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they didn't do it because it wouldn't work. I will say this: Ann and Bell and I tend to hang out a couple times at the uh, paranormal conventions, and I've sat her on a chair. Uh-huh. And now this is the real Raggedy Ann Annabelle. Yes, I will set her on a chair, and she's done up just like the original Annabelle doll, doll and not. Uh, Dogs and animals will go right by it. They'll look at it like, oh, crap, what is that? And they go buy it. Mm. It's the stupid people that come up to it and say, oh, look, it's Annabelle. And they start shaking its hand. Now, what if I really did have the real Annabelle? (laughs) Would you come up and shake the damn thing's hand? 
Oh, you, well, you, you would, but most okay. normal people <laughs> would have. Uh, and I'm they, floating now. They yeah. have some reserves. But about the it. dogs were smarter than the people. The dogs are like, I don't know what that is. Hell with that. I'm out of here. Right. Now, and now you're saying that at, where was it? Was it Comic Con you had it? It was at uh, Washington State Paracon last year. Last and year and at the uh, yeah. Paranormal for Pause. All right, so what you're saying, this year. is why I get it. So you had a duplicate of the Raggedy Ann Annabelle? Yep. Yes. Okay, presented it as the real thing? Yep. Okay, first of all, you're a, you're a fraudster. Yep, uh, second, I am. But it, it is interesting, yeah, that that was the reaction. Yep. First of all, that people... Again, see, the belief is thin. In other words, this thing is supposed to be under lock and key, locked up when it can't yeah. hurt anybody. And people are you know, foolish right, enough to right, think a, he would be able right, to get a, his a, hands a, on right, it. Right, a guest at the convention has it on his knee. And isn't charging any money. Isn't charging yeah. any money, and they think it's Annabelle. Yeah. Right, so, again, it's, I, yeah. Um, all right, let's go back to the movie. Uh, not the movies, but the music. <laughs> uh, let's go back to some genuine Creepy stuff. These guys aren't kidding. Uh, Dimu Barger, Dreamside Dominions, one of the clown's favorites here on the Haunted Cabaret on Rhode Island Free Radio.
All right, that was Ben U. Borger, Greenside Dominions, here on the Haunted Cabaret on Rhode Island Free Radio. And I say, some, unlike some of the uh, skin-deep scares that we've been talking about, you know, associated with other people, uh, Dimu, that's a satanic band that, you know, they mean it. I mean, no question about it. Or they make us believe that they mean it, which, when it comes right down to it, right, that's the same thing. Yeah. If you can yeah. make your fans believe in you. Yeah, if you can believe, if, if you can make people enough people believe in it, then it's true. Kind of like all those years, I thought the Ramones were actually brothers. <laughs> yep, I fell for it. And that means you also fell for the idea that all they could afford was those ripped jeans. <laughs> after, 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 they, after they passed their million album mark. Not, not, damn, they just, yep, not, they just have a problem. They have a cash drain. Those, <laughs> those ripped jeans. Uh, nope, Ramones, I'll tell you. They had one. The other thing is people always said right to the end of their career that they were um, unpretentious and uh, they just walked out there with no stage show. <laughs> they were like polar opposite of bands like Kiss and Judas Priest, um, which I always thought was funny because the Ramones had one of the most choreographed stages <laughs> of anybody in the history of rock and roll, right down to the color, co- color combinations. And um, yeah, I mean, the reason they wore those black leather jackets on stage was because they played off a white and blue background. And uh, the black leather looked really good against the bright, wa- the, you know, the yeah, it popped. It popped against the bright white, yeah. And you know, Didi Ramon just plain old popped, <laughs> and uh, and everything went went really well. And Johnny Ramon managed the money, which he was uh, as obsessed about as Chuck Berry and Gene Simmons. <laughs> but just goes to show all these rock and roll fans who claim you can't be artistically expressive and focused on the money, you're stupid. I mean, no... Poor planning. You know, what's that? They just have poor planning skills. No, what do you mean? The people that think... The people that have, think you can't do both. No, they're just stupid. Yeah. I mean, it, no place else. I mean, hip-hop, you try to tell a hip-hop artist that he's got to be true to his art and give up the money. <laughs> I mean, he'll laugh at you. Yeah. Country and Western guy. You know, you go to the fair, you see one of, you know, you see one of those... Um, you know, ladies or men folks there, you know, singing about adultery and uh, drinking and all those other fine country western <laughs> themes. You think at the end of the day they're going to say, nah, sorry, I'm going to pass up on that uh, moolah. You know, it's, yeah. you know I just, it, expressing myself was enough. You know, and just kind of give the money back to the fair to, you know, you know pay for cleaning up the uh, manure and so on. Yeah. No, you think they're going to do that? No. Yeah. No. No, only rock and roll. I, I think it was, um, I think it was Jay-Z that pointed out in one of his interviews, that only rock and roll people, and that would be, you know, whatever you want to call rock and like rock and roll, rock, metal, um, folk rock, whatever. People that actually play instruments. People that actually play instruments. There you go. Yeah, there you go. <coughs> uh, well, aside from the country western dudes. <laughs> yeah, they're the only ones foolish enough to buy the music business. And that's where it came from, by the way. You know, the music industry back in the day promoted the idea that you couldn't be true to your artistic principles and make a lot of money, yeah. which justified them paying these artists, yeah. you know, barely enough to get by on and survive. Yeah. That, that's where that came from. Just enough to pay for that's the, where this, that's where the Yeah, that's where the whole thing came from, the music industry itself, to justify not paying rock bands what they owed them. And it's come down to us to this day. Well, okay. It's, uh, me, myself, personally, the only problem I have with that is that it makes Tony Jones and the Cretan 3, it makes our job a little harder, you know, making the money that we're entitled to. <laughs> That's the only problem I have with it. If you want to be that dumb, go ahead. <laughs> but that stigma still lives, and it's hard to get past. Right. I mean, that, it's, one of the, yeah, it's one of the few stigmas that still live. I mean, there's that stigma... The only stigma I can think of that equals that is maybe the do-it-yourself publishing thing. Now, yeah. now when I say and when I say publishing, I mean the, like the printed word. Mm-hmm. In other, because in music, as we all know in this room, do-it-yourself is a noble enterprise. Yeah. I mean, if you know, if you record your own music, if you market your own CDs, market your own T-shirts, and make yeah. money at it. And the same thing with filmmaking. Same thing with filmmaking. Exactly, it's a noble endeavor. Mm-hmm. For some reason, only, yeah, and this came to mind recently because I was at one of the conventions and uh, the, 
the New England Horror Writers Society or whatever they call themselves. Yeah, they they and and you could tell that it was obviously everything on their table was self produced. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was there was no professional publications there. Yeah. Which, I, which then I said to myself, well, maybe that's part of the reason. Because, yes, we do it yourself in music. Yes, you do it yourself in film. But that doesn't stop us from coming up with a professional quality product. Exactly. You know, for some reason, maybe they, you know, maybe the uh, written word self-publishing world, you know, they, they feel that they've absorbed the stigma to such an extent <laughs> that they feel like they can't publish anything that looks professional. I'm not quite sure. I don't know if it's harder to publish a large, like a book per se, to have that actually physically created for you versus cre you can create your own DVD cover pretty easily. You can create CD labels and stuff like that basically right, right, on because, your own. Yeah, because the CD, in other words, the CD format, because the CD, you're saying the CD format is pretty much set. Yeah, but creating and printing a book and pressing it together isn't something that you can do inside your own home, per se. No, it's not. But on the other hand, I, you can't just... I but mean, we don't... Do we don't pay for We garbage? don't produce... Yeah, but we don't produce the CD jackets ourselves either. Mm. I mean, the, the, the CD cases, I should say. Yeah. You know, you send the artwork to the appropriate place, and they return a bunch of CDs and, the, you know... Yeah. Yeah, but... Um, yeah, but maybe... But I... All these... So I looked around this booth of the, the self-published horror. <laughs> it didn't make me want to pick up any. No. But I said, you know what? So I picked up. You know, and now the writers themselves, let, let's, let's touch on this too. Now, if there's anybody that's more hangdog and miserable looking <laughs> than, you know, musicians. It's self-publishers. It's, it's self-published authors. <laughs> I mean, there must have been like eight of them sitting around, a, a, what was it, a... For a, a three-sided square table. Horseshoe style. Horseshoe style table. They were slumped. They were slumped <laughs> like, I got to... Thanks for noticing me. <laughs> yeah, they, they were slumped over. So they like, weren't exuding any confidence, so you didn't The only thing they were exuding them. was perspiration. Oh, my. Because I, I, don't, I don't feel that they had changed their clothes in a couple of days. Yeah. But I think that's the only thing... Now, we can identify with people like this, right? We, we've seen them. Yeah, I've seen them. We know them personally. I, I personally Some know that. Some of them like, are our best I, I've fans. seen that with the, with the books, but for some reason, that that doesn't catch me with the comic books uh, creators. A lot of the comic book writers it and doesn't. creators, they... They're um, energetic, Yeah, and you want to read their confident. stuff because it's something new, and they're putting that out to you. I mean, I just shelled out, I've never done this before, uh, $10 on some dude's comic book because it was something new that I haven't seen. And he, right. he came right up to me and was right, all right. positive. He was, right, he was hustling. And, and I don't see this. I say this as a positive. He was hustling his product. Right. Yes. He was moving his merchandise. In a professional manner In a professional well. manner. And, and I, I remember the comic book you were t with, you're talking about, if it's the same one. Probably. Yeah, I mean, that was a quality product. And the dude sitting there, I mean, most, like, you go to some of these uh, local author stores and you go to pick up, pick up one of their books and, and they just look at you. They don't interact with you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they're like, like they're whatever, you got this book. It's kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like you just shot them in the head. Yeah. And they're just waiting for that last trickle of life to expire as they look at you like cow like. Yeah, they're kinda just like waiting for you to put it down. And because they're staring at you so awkwardly, you kind of put it down and yeah, walk away because like, you're afraid to make contact. Yeah, because you wonder, like, what's wrong here? Yeah. You just get that unsettling feeling of. There is an exception to that, though. And I, I will say this because they are my friends. Um, Tom D'Agostino, like an incredible writer. If you pick up his book, he will come forth to you and start <laughs> he'll tell you everything explaining about it. the book and what it's going and, and, and he'll Arlene will jump in yeah. and fill in the details so, and the blanks. And in, other, in other words, you go from no information to too much information. No, he does a good job. And then you got Keith uh, Johnson who writes a really yeah, good book. Keith and Sandra are an amazing uh, tag teamer for Andrew Lake. Maybe it's just you like know, the, No, you know what the difference is there? With, since you mentioned Keith, I think I'll put my finger on the difference. The difference is that Keith is a demonologist. Keith does has his career before he wrote the book. Yeah. True. And so See, that's, did in Tom. other words, right. And oh, Tom, there you go. See, that's the, yeah, they, that's the difference. In other they words, were knowledgeable about their chosen field they're writing about. Right. right. They have a career, a chosen field, and then they choose to write about it. 
but they're proud of it too. Like that's yeah. the other and thing. They're, they're proud. proud they proud. They want to. Yeah, and there was have. a gentleman we uh, he passed away um, a couple years back. Uh, he started recreating some of H.P. Uh, Lovecraft stuff, and he was very uh, high strung. And he was very. What do you mean recreating? He was adding parts to the stories, and he had uh, permission to do so. Um, I will bring the info up on him next time we're in the seat. Uh, but he was very uh, positive, telling people, like, you know, live for the moment type deal, and he wanted you to yeah, read I his think books. He was using the characters, but writing different stories around the characters. Yeah, and oh, he, you can do, oh, you yeah. can do that. Those are pastiches. I mean, yeah. you know, you and he did, a, he did a good job of it. But I have come across, like you said, the, the ones that could care less that you're there. Yeah. Like Some so of those self-published uh, comic book people are hustling because if they don't sell a few copies, they have no way to get home. Yeah. <laughs> they can't get out of their mom's basement. They're not eating that day. Yeah. 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 They're like, uh-oh. Yeah, no, where, yeah, whereas maybe some of these authors, I don't know, they're, I don't know, they're accountants or they're security guards or they're... They're trying to find maybe that big break. Nine to five already. And, <laughs> right, they, and, they, and they haven't figured out, now listen up, you people, you know who you are. They haven't figured out that marketing yourself is the way to get that break. Yeah. And what I don't understand is, and it's exactly the same what we're doing here, if you're going to put that much work into something, why not try to get it out to as many people as possible? I mean, why would you, you know, it's why almost like, limit yourself, you know, right? why would you go, it's almost like going that far and having sex and not having a climax, right? Like you've gotten right. to the end. Yeah, right. This is the fun part. Yeah, and yeah. It's like don't sometimes the orgasm. <laughs> we'll show up to conventions in Massachusetts and the people will say, well, your show's not on in here. Well, no, it's not, but I would like it to be. And by me being here selling my DVDs to you guys, you're watching what I'm producing down there. And hopefully someone will say, hey, we got an opening up here. We'd like to have your show up here. Yeah, so maybe either, either writing the book took their last ounce of energy. Yeah, they're, they're, they're just yeah. nothing but slump, slump slugs of mashed potatoes now because this masterpiece they wrote, which is probably about a vampire biting a little kid or something, <laughs> something we've, heard, we've seen it a million times before. But it bit the, my gerbil. But it, but it, yeah, the gerbil vampire. Actually, not a bad idea for a self-published book. It'll... <laughs> Just make Especially sure they don't come that, out of that. <laughs> oh, it's yes. going to be that kind of vampiric, gerbil vampire. Vampiric flatulence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, either they're, they've exhausted themselves emotionally yeah. or else... Um, Maybe they're afraid mom was right all those years yeah. while they were writing that book for 10 years. Yeah, that's true. You know, I mean, it depends on the people you have in your life, too. If, you, if you're in a situation where everybody keeps telling you that you suck, eventually you start to believe that right. you suck. Right, and resisting that psychic you suck <laughs> took up, right, that's, they wrote the book and then they resisting the energy yeah, took they, up all their remaining energy and that's why they sit there yeah. waiting. Or the only alternative is that they believe they've written a masterpiece <laughs> and that somehow psychically... The book will sell itself. The, right, we're supposed to know <laughs> somehow... That, that it's amazing. Right, that this... That this Job of the Hut imitation <laughs> is sitting behind the counter with a stack of books in front of him and a pen waiting to sign them. <laughs> and we're supposed to know that this is like the, the greatest th book since The Shining. We're, yeah. we're just supposed to it's know like this. It's like that diamond in the rough just sitting there waiting to be right. discovered. Right. Now I, now, I understand the tendency. I mean, I understand the, um, what would you say, the, not tendency, but th in other words, I'm not... I'm basically self-taught to be an extrovert, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are moments when my uh, introvertness from a young age comes back to haunt me yeah. from time to time. So I understand, you know, especially, and, I, and I've, been, I've done sales, I've, I've done door-to-door -door sales, talk about horror, right? Oh, God. Now, you know, stealing You're yourself to walk man. up to a door that you've never been to before, with, knowing that you have a product that's going to be a hard sell, that could be get a door slammed and, in your and face. Get a door, you, right, very big pos the percentages are. Yeah. And if you didn't knock on that door, right? Yeah. I understand that. Same thing as one of these that authors. You know, say, has okay, to be you so got high. the right, you got this product and you gotta basically shove it down people's throats to get them to take an in, a notice yeah. of it. The difference is, guess what? I knocked on those doors. Yeah. <laughs> I mean I mean, if you 
If you're at a convention per se, you paid for that table, you paid for your gas to get there, you're going to pay for at least one ma meal sitting there. I think you're making them cry right about now. <laughs> there's a convention ongoing and they're listening. It's like just man up. Oh, and, I, I, or I've seen it. Up, so to and, say. and this, this is way, totally true. Like going to these cons, the people that come up and say, oh, I didn't sell a damn thing. This convention sucked. Uh, and this goes for like books, artists, whatever. If you are it's listening to me, I, I walk by your booth and you're setting down almost camouflaged in the curtains. Mm. And then yeah. you wonder why the guy next to you who's getting up interacting with the people is selling more stuff. Well, because he's interacting with the people. That goes for the celebrities, too. I mean, you'll get the celebrities that'll sit there and say, oh, this con sucks. Well, the people don't really know who you are, yeah. and the ones that do, you're not interacting with them. Or, or, or you're, just, you're, just con you're just conveying a negative emotion. Yeah, I mean, it's, guys, it, it it's comes to, the money is not going to come to you. You have to go get I, it. I hate to say it, but it's almost like being a carnival barker because... Most people don't bring the credit card to one of these cons and just go ham for the weekend. Right. They have come with forty, fifty, sixty dollars worth of spending money, and that's it. They're done when they're done. Right. So you have two yeah. tasks at a con. Yeah. You have to interest the person in your product, whatever that might be, and you also have to establish a contact with this person that will see you through further after the con. <laughs> exactly. In other words, you have to be able to contact this person on social media. Yep. And say, you know, hey, chuckles. Yeah, this is so-and-so. Remember, we were bullshitting at Comic-Con, mm -hmm. and you know, I got something else now, or I yeah. want to invite you down to this other thing. or yeah. I mean, you got to be able to do that. So you got, your job is make contact and follow through. Follow, follow through, exactly. If you don't follow through on your self-marketing, no one else will for you. Right, well said. Okay, let's follow through with some music right now. Um, ah, this is a good one. Uh, how about some Motorhead? Love me like a reptile. Talk about follow through. Here on the Haunted Cabaret in Rhode Island Free Radio.
All right, that was Motorhead, the unmistakable sounds of Motorhead. Love me like a reptile here on the Haunted Cabaret. And as much as I love Motorhead and as much as I love Lemmy, as a person very familiar with reptiles and uh, the keeping of reptiles, I must tell Lemmy that the electric eel is not a reptile. Don't you have a large scar from a reptile? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, from a bona fide reptile, in fact. Uh, my iguana wobble. <laughs> Male? Male iguana. Oh, they're yes. vicious. They can be. The problem was that I gave him too much uh, territory because I bought him as a small reptile, a couple of inches long. No problem there. He was friendly then. But what I did is I gave him, we had a spare room in the house, and I gave him his own room. Damn. Oh, my. A reptile's and living better than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, he didn't think so. I think this re- iguana always want, dreamed of being a Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> and just nothing we, nothing we did was ever good enough. You know, I, you know, my girlfriend at the time, she would make, I mean, she would make him salads that would rival a salad you would get down on, in a Federal Hill restaurant. Wow. Right. She, she, she spoiled this animal rotten, and, which was funny because when we first started going out a few years before, she, was, she had no love for reptiles, put it that way. But you know, we had the room, so you know, I had the iguana, and, I, and yeah, she, you know, he won her over. So she would make this animal salads. You know, then, then he needed vitamins you know, to yeah. duplicate his tropical diet. We'll put the vitamins on that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> She'd bring the salad into the room in, the, in his dish, drop it and run <laughs> because <laughs> he would he mess her up. He, w- he was out for blood. He charged with teeth and claws. Wow. <laughs> and, yep, and I'll make a long story short because uh, we're coming to the end of the show. But basically, I was bitten down to the tendons on my left wrist wow. by Owie. this animal in his adulthood because I forgot that he is a wild animal. Yeah. And then. You know, my girlfriend had a cat, and um, I had a full-grown male iguana, and I was stupid enough to try to play with both of them. Oh. That stupid. You know, went to get his dish to get him his food in the morning, left the door open to his room. Reptile come, you know, the iguana wanders out into the kitchen to see what's out in the kitchen because he didn't want to wait for his food. Yeah, curiosity. Right, curiosity. Cat comes wandering over to visit the iguana. (laughs) Right, now, right, Tyrannosaurus Rex versus King Kong, right? Basically. Me... Being the stupid that I am, puts my arm between the two animals. Oh my! Damn. Goodbye. Yeah, the doctor was pretty impressed when I showed up at the clinic with the bite. <laughs> She's, what? <laughs> the iguana I, still hanging on. <laughs> <laughs> well, he let go, and and he the thing was he was pissed at having bitten me. In other words, in his mind, I made him bite. Yeah, I made ta- him do the work. Yeah, I made him bite. I tasted damn awful. <laughs> he spit me out. <laughs> Gave me a dirty look, and I ran to the sink to try to stop the blood running out of my wrist. And <laughs> yeah, my girlfriend looked at it. And she, That's not going to stop by itself, you know. <laughs> sure, it will. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. So, like, this, so at the clinic, I'm at the clinic, and uh, I'm in the the little room with the curtain pulled, you know, uh, waiting, yeah. you know, for the doctor. And um, I hear the doctor outside. The, the, this, you know, very usually a very calm lady doctor, you know, seeing everything. Yeah, I hear. A what? <laughs> she, she comes into the room. What bit you? I said, an iguana. She says, spell it. <laughs> I-G-U-A. And oh, an iguana. Okay. Took her a half hour to sew me up. Right? Oh. Because it, it, was, it was around the wrist. It took some very delicate stitching. Yeah. You know, yeah. 12 stitches. Very delicate stitching. She said, now this is some of my best work. Don't let them do this again. <laughs> But it was all worth. It, the whole thing was worth it when I walked into the clinic and uh, the girl at the receptionist said, "Can I help you?" <laughs> <laughs> yep. And I explained. And you're like, "See this puddle that's following <laughs> me?" <laughs> yeah. So that. Yep. So that's my uh, vicious reptile story, uh, which I had coming. I, I really never fig- a reptile. A dog or a cat is a dog or a cat. A reptile is always a wild animal. Uh, Tony, is that about wrapping it up? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's put on some, uh, let's get out of here with some goat whore for as long as it lasts. Uh, Ending our episode of The Haunted Cabaret here on Rhode Island Free Radio. Nighty night.